Hello, uh, this is Bernie Wall and in this video today I want to look at the top 10 uh, writing questions um, about IELTS writing that uh, I've picked out from the questions that students usually ask me. If you saw the last video then you'll know that we address the top 10 reading questions. So I now have the same for writing and I hope that um, some of these questions are ones that you are thinking about or worrying about or just need to know the answers. So um, as usual, I have a list of the questions, so I'll just get those up and then um, we can answer them and then hopefully you'll get the answers to these problems. So let me start with the top 10 IELTS writing questions. and sometimes these questions are things you think you know it's a silly question I don't want to ask it but remember there's no such thing as a silly question and if you've got the, that question then it's quite likely that another 10 people have it too so it's always going to be useful to get the answer so let's start with the first five right this is a question I get all the time um, you have to improve your spelling. If you make any spelling mistakes, they will count against you and they will decrease your band. So if you have spelling issues, then it's something that you must address. Spelling is a problem in English, as you know. It's a problem for us too, as English speakers. Um, much of primary school is spent uh, memorizing words and how they're spelt. Uh, quite often primary school children have to learn 10 new words every week and they need to know how to do the spelling. I don't know if you've heard of spelling bees, but that's one way to improve spelling. So if you look online and find spelling bees, that's B-E-E, -E, like the little insect, then maybe you can find some to help you. Um, if there are words that you know you spell wrongly, then just find the spelling and just memorize them so that you don't spell them wrongly again. When you learn a new word, try and make sure you know how to spell that word correctly. Um, but it's just a case of memorizing, practicing, memorizing. Um, if you're on my IELTS step-by-step -step course, then we have a lot of help with spelling in our writing section on the website. And we also have um, a series of spelling bees as well. But you have to tackle it. It's not going to happen by, um, by luck or overnight. You'll just have to work on it. This is a bit the same. Of course, they'll check grammar mistakes. Good grammar is part of language. Grammar mistakes mean that the language is wrong and therefore you won't get any credit for it. So again, do yourself a little audit. Think about the mistakes you make. The most common mistakes are articles, uh, agreement of subject and verb, prepositions. All of these come up again and again in writing. One of the best ways to check your grammar is to get somebody who can check your writing. So the best person obviously would be an IELTS teacher because they can check not only your grammar but also everything else about your writing. But if you get somebody to check your, gra your writing and tell you where the grammar mistakes are and then work on it, you should have a grammar book or access to a grammar site where you can check and learn and practice any grammar issues that you have. If you have bad grammar, it definitely will count against you. So again, like the spelling, you have to work on it. Yes, this is a question I get. Um, I think the wording on the test is at least, I think. But anyway, basically 150 and 250. If you write less, then you're not fulfilling the rubric or the rules, if you like, of the uh, writing exam. So you need to have at least the number of words that they say. If you go too far over, then you're, you're running the risk of having lots more mistakes. So the more you write, the more potential there is for error. 
So I would say somewhere between 150 and 180 for the, for the first task would be optimum and between 250 and 280 for the second task. Um, try to keep within that, that limit. That means that you'll be able to do it in the time and you don't run the risk of um, too many mistakes because you've written too much. Generally, I think you only get penalized if it's low, if it's under the word count. But if you go too far over the word count, then there's a question as to whether you'll be able to manage both tasks and also whether you've actually done enough preparation and checking. So rather than write 300 words plus, use that extra time to check what you have written so that you don't give any mistakes to the examiner. Right, this is a million dollar question. I would say the planning in task one is around the organization of the data or the information. Okay, let me take academic first. So look at the data and look at how you're going to organize that data into the two paragraphs. Usually there are two ways of doing it. There might even be three ways of doing it. I would pick the easiest or the one that seems the most obvious to you and then look at the data and decide what you're going to put in, in paragraph one and what you're going to put in paragraph two. And that's really the extent of your planning. So look at um, highest numbers, lowest numbers, anything you can group together because they're around the same number. Um, and then decide what you're going to allocate to each paragraph. The same would be true in a process. So how much of the process will you put in the first paragraph? How much in the second? The same with the maps. So how much of the map or what part of the, um, the change in the map is going to go in paragraph one and what's going to go in paragraph two? And just make a few notes around that so that when you start the writing, you stick to what you've decided. So that would be my planning for task one. If you're talking about general training, the letter, then I would say the first thing you should do is look at what you have to do in the task, decide if it's formal, informal, or semi-formal, and then think about what answer you want to your letter. So if you start with the answer that you're expecting, that will help you then to decide how to write the letter. So you should write the letter to get that response. So if you've lost your credit card and you want a new credit card to be sent, write the letter so that the person reading it will say, ah, we'll send them a new credit card. If you're asking somebody to help you with something, write the letter so that they're going to say, yes, of course, I'll help you with that. So think about the response that you want. Think about the style. Think about who you're writing it to. Is it a friend or is it somebody you don't know? And that will help you with the language. And then again, think about what you want to say and how you're going to organize these, these, this information into paragraph one and into paragraph two. So your planning for the letter will be a little bit more like the planning for task two. Whereas with the academic task one, it would be a little bit different. It'll be an analysis and an allocation of the information. And plus planning task two. Personally, I think this is vital. Having a good plan does several things for you. First of all, it means that you know exactly what you're going to write before you start. So it usually makes the writing faster. Secondly, it means that while you write, you can focus on language. You can focus on sentence structure, on linking words, on how you're going to introduce your supporting material, your examples. So essentially, it takes away the problem of the ideas. So once you've got the ideas in your plan, then don't change them. Just then focus on how you're going to express them, how you're going to persuade the examiner about your ideas. Then you can think about vocabulary, sentence structure, linking words, complex sentences, all of these things that you need. 
when you don't plan, what happens is the ideas get in the way. And then quite often you write sort of like a stream of consciousness and the cohesion is affected and the grammar is affected and the spelling and everything else is affected because you're not focusing on language. So it's very important to do a good plan. And the plan should give you a couple of ideas for the introduction. Then you need maybe two main ideas and some students only use one main idea in their first paragraph and the same for your second paragraph. Then what are your reasons for believing this? And have you got extra reasons? So you can use words like furthermore or moreover. And then finally, you might want to give an example of why you believe this and then move on to your second point or your second two points in your second paragraph and do the same but don't make them identical because we don't want too much repetition so maybe you'll have an example in the first paragraph but not in the second you might have a summarizing sentence in the second and then your conclusion should match your introduction so if your introduction says i'm going to do this 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 your conclusions should say you can see how i've done this and it should not be a surprise so nothing new ever in the conclusion. And if your introduction is three sentences, which is what I would recommend roughly, then your conclusion should be maybe two sentences. Could be three, but something that balances. Okay, let's have a look at six to ten. So how can you improve your achievement? Basically by analysing the task very well. So think about firstly, what is it that they are looking for? Are they looking for a discussion? Uh, are they looking for your opinion? Do they want you to decide um, how far you can agree or disagree? Are they asking you to expose problems and, and suggest solutions? So that's the first thing you need to look at. What exactly must I achieve here? Then look at the question and the different parts of the question. Sometimes you may have two or three different things that you have to include. Now, if you make sure you cover all of those elements and provide uh, the appropriate answer, so whether that's a discussion or a problem solution or an advantages, disadvantages, that's critical, then you should have good task to achievement. What can happen, and this happens a lot when students don't plan, is that you start to go off at a tangent. You get hold of one issue and that goes rambling on. And in the end, you have answered a completely different question to the one that was set. And obviously, if that happens, you're not going to get a high mark for your achievement on the task. So make sure that you analyze the question well, don't miss out any of the parts of it and then plan that into your little plan so that you're going to include everything and your cohesion is going to be um, well executed so that the examiner is able to follow your, th your thoughts and your ideas smoothly and fluently to the end of the task. But analysing the question is the way to do this. Okay, checking and correcting. <clears throat> First of all, and this is vital, leave yourself a, a few minutes to do this. Two or three minutes should be enough. However, you can be more prepared for your checking and correction if you have a checklist already. And you can do this as you go through your preparation. There must be, for everybody, certain mistakes that you make every time and when you see it that you've perhaps missed an article or you haven't agreed your subject or verb or you've got the wrong preposition these are common ones you see it and say I can't believe I did that I know that those are the kinds of things that should go on your mental checklist so those are the things you check first have I got all my articles correct have I used at and the in the right place have I got plural verbs with my plural nouns subjects. So have this mental checklist of doing that. 
And then think about other things you might often make a mistake with, like a spelling, for example. Is there a word or two words that you always get mixed up on the spelling? They should also be in your, um, in your checklist. So if you have a checklist in your head of the things you normally make mistakes with, then you check all of those first and that will remove a lot of the errors. And then the very best way to correct work is to read it out loud. Now, I know in the exam that may not be possible, but while you're doing your practice, there's no reason why you cannot read your work aloud to yourself. And generally, whenever there's a mistake, you will stumble or you will stop because it's not clear. And that then focuses you on where the errors are and you can then look more carefully and see what the error is. If you get used to doing this, then when you go back in the exam and check, you'll be able, I think, in your head to read in your head and still find these errors. Um, but it takes practice. So make sure that you make checking and correcting part of your overall practice when you do writing. Okay, ideas. Students often say to me, I don't have any ideas. Remember, the ideas are not so important, so long as they are relevant and fit the task. And you only need two or three, sometimes four, but not very many. If you have a couple of really strong ideas and you are able to support them with evidence and with reasons, and you are able to give an example, and you are able to use language that will persuade the examiner about your ideas, that's all you need to do. So don't worry about the ideas, but if you really are stuck with ideas, look at the topics. There's a limited range of topics that come up for the writing in task two. And if you make sure that you have some ideas on all those topics, so things like education, things like health, things like environment, transport, just read through old models, IELTS models, or read some articles online about these topics and get a few ideas for each of the topics so that if you get that topic in the exam, you're not going to be worried about finding an idea. It's all part of your preparation. Don't leave it till the last minute. Make sure that you prepare well and prepare properly. And that's not just doing test after test. That's doing these other things like you know, working on spelling, working on grammar, working on getting ideas, getting new vocabulary, all of that should be a major part of your preparation for the IELTS exam. Okay, next one, tenses. Right, the good news is that for academic writing, you probably won't need much more than present simple and past simple. So if you look at models, you will find that a lot of the writing only uses these two tenses. The reason is that it talks mostly, or you'll be talking mostly in your writing about facts or about truths. And so that kind of um, language only needs present and past simple. Sometimes you might need to use present perfect. You will... Um, Possibly, if you, if you use words like nowadays or in recent years, you'll need present perfect. So that's worth checking as well. Again, to check these things, you go back to your grammar book. Make sure you know how to use them properly. The only writing where you'll need to use a range of tenses will be the letter in general training because sometimes you need to talk about events that have happened you need to tell some kind of story and therefore you will need a range of tenses which might include um, continuous forms and also past perfect the same is true of the map writing in academic task one so in that particular thing where you've got a whole period from the, late, from the re recent past to the more distant past, then you'll need to use a range of tenses. But you can learn about how to use tenses in any grammar book. So go back to your grammar book, look at tenses, look at um, 
narrative tenses in particular, and that will show you how to use the tenses at their appropriate time frames. Okay. And finally, how can you move from 6.5 to band 7? That is another million dollar question. Okay, all of the above will help. Working on your grammar, working on your spelling, working on um, your ideas and how to, how to explain them. You need to use a good range of vocabulary, so try not to repeat words. Try not to repeat the same phrases as well over and over. Try each time to have a different type of sentence structure. You need generally to use a lot of uh, gerunds, present participles. In fact, I find more and more when I'm working with students who are in this situation, and most of my students are in this situation, that we keep coming again and again back to grammar and how to use the grammar. And that doesn't mean tenses. It's mostly other things. So gerunds, countable, uncountable nouns. These kinds of things are what will make your writing improve. So you need as few errors as possible. And you also need a wide range of vocabulary. You need some good, sophisticated sentence structures, including uh, complex sentences. And you basically need a fairly sophisticated um, level of writing to score band seven. You have to have all of your sentences related to each other, not just a list. Sometimes if I look at students who are getting band six or band 6.5, I can see that they have lots of very good sentences, but the sentences read like a list. Like this is sentence one, sentence two, sentence three. They are not connected to each other. They're not related to each other. And they have to be to get anywhere near band seven. Your, your writing has to be coherent. And you have to manage that cohesion very well with linking words, with references like pronouns. Um, so think about all of this sort of writing. And my final word on this is that, to be quite honest, I think it's very difficult, if not almost impossible, to do this unless you get somebody to check your writing and actually explain to you why you're not getting band seven. What are the things that you're not doing? What are the features that are missing from your writing? And unless you know these things, you won't be able to fix them. And if you can't fix them, you'll just keep getting 6.5. So please, the best thing you can do to move from 6.5 is to get somebody to check it and somebody that knows what they're doing so that they can tell you what you need to do to move away from band 6.5. Okay, so that was the last of the questions. I hope that um, these have been useful and that you've got some tips there. Um, in my next video, I will be talking about listening and the top 10 questions for listening. If you go to my website, ieltslearning.com, you'll find an article I wrote on these top 10 questions. And there are some links there to things like spelling, etc. So go over and have a look at that. And there are other materials there that will help you with your um, IELTS band 7 and 8. Okay, thank you. And I'll uh, see you in the next video.